I often like to begin these, uh, you know, when we're in the middle of the six week class by just congratulating all of us that we came back because I mean, it's totally fine if it's somebody, you know, not somebody's cup of tea, but often it's not so much that it's that we get swept away by the busyness in our lives. And uh, in a way, it's kind of the, the big, one of the big tragedies in life. It isn't that, you know, we don't know how to take care of ourselves in these deep ways or take care of each other in deep ways, but we get distracted. We get pulled here, we get pulled there, and there's a nice show on, and got to do this. And uh, these teachings that we get from the Buddha, and it's really, I think I mentioned in week one, it's kind of like the the depth of human common sense, like that we should live our lives being present, <laughs> as opposed to, like you can imagine a self-help book. Best idea, you know, you want the secret of life, be distracted. <laughs> no one would say that. So we have these teachings, but the thing is we don't really sense the value until we put some time in. I mean, it makes sense when someone talks about mindful awareness, but it doesn't seem like changing, you know, it doesn't seem like a deal breaker to going to make everything right. But it really, I mean, the Buddha was really provocative when he talked about there is an end to suffering. It doesn't mean that we're immune from pain. You know, pain is endemic in life. There's aging, there's loss. There's all kinds of insults and disappointments that just are inherent in being a human being, right? So how can being present make a dent in that or change that? And that's the point, you actually have to check it out. One of the most well-known Pali phrases, so Pali is one of those ancient languages in India, very much related to Sanskrit. And the early Buddhist teachings were recorded in that language. And there's a famous Pali phrase, it goes, ehi pasiko, come and check it out. That's what it means. Because it's not enough to hear it, we actually have to put some time in and then if we put enough time in then, and some of you who've been practicing for a while may feel like this is becoming true for you, but we begin to sense a feedback mechanism. There's a pleasure, an inner pleasure to being present. Just like there's an inner weight and heaviness to being distracted and disconnected and fragmented and you know pushed around by our likes and dislikes, which is sort of the ordinary state of mind. So it doesn't stand out so much as being stressful or even worse, you know, unbearable, because it's sort of the norm. So just uh, wanted to start there just to encourage all of us, myself included, to put time in. And, you know, there's a bit, it's a, almost a little cultish, you know, about finding time to do a daily set, even if it's just a couple of minutes. And, and the daily sit isn't so different than the rest of the day, except in our daily sit, we're optimizing the conditions, right? So the cell phone is off and the dog or cat knows to leave you alone or in the other room and the kids or the people you live with know not to bother you and you're sitting in a relatively comfortable, relatively upright way. And in those optimal, with those optimal conditions, we cultivate our practice to be alert and relaxed. And it's one thing, you know, we all know that it's possible, possible to be aware of the present moment, like we can do it right now, can't we? Listening to Mark, hearing the sound of Mark's voice is like this, or feeling the body sitting is like this, or feeling self-conscious is like this, 
So we can have a moment where there's present moment awareness, but we really start to get a sense of the transforming power when we can sustain present moment awareness, that continuity. Next week in particular, we'll look at what gets in the way of the continuity of present moment awareness. So you can take notes this week and bring it back for our discussion time next week. What is it? Because there, there are going to be some regular you know, interrupters, regular obstacles that show up, like the planning mind or doubt, like, am I doing this right? But the awareness doesn't catch, oh, doubt is being known, right? So we get sort of take the bait, we identify with the doubt, and we start to think about our practice. And remember, thinking isn't, as, you know, isn't in itself bad, but thinking without awareness, knowing that thinking is being known or that thinking is happening, that means we're lost at thought which is almost all the time, right? One of the great uh, Thai masters from the last century, the Thai Buddhist monk characterized uh, modern times or the modern mind as lost in thought. And that's the basic predicament. And it's just the way it is. I mean, it's just, it's not specific to one or two people. This is our cultural phenomena where in our thoughts. And we rarely visit the present moment. I mean, we're here in the present moment, but there isn't an awareness. Oh, it's like this. In order to sustain present moment awareness, we have to, and this is usually what I talk about week three, and then we'll practice it in just a few minutes. But we have to understand that because we often talk about when we're first learning the practice, like how to be aware of some object of our experience, like feeling the breath coming into the body or being aware of hearing or being aware of the body, generally the body or even specifically different touch points, like feel the sit bones pressing down on the cushion or the chair or whatever. But there's always, in a sense, in every moment, there are two things. There's the experience or the object that's being known. And then the, there's the way the mind is relating to that experience or to that object. So when I'm you know, hearing my voice now, when I hear that pitch or tone, you know, I might relate to it with embarrassment or I might relate to it with pride. And so the way we're relating actually turns out to be pretty important. Like in terms of connecting with the present moment, it's not just what we're knowing through the six sense gates. I think I went through that week one. Did I go through that? So it's just the five physical senses. And then these are the six ways we know the present moment or we know reality, we could say even. We're aware of mental activity, that's the sixth sense gate, right? Because we can be aware of thought and emotion and we're aware of seeing and hearing and tasting and smelling and touching. And then these are the six ways the mind is sensitive. And whatever, we've, whatever experience we've ever had in our life has always been some combination of these six things. There's it's a list that's designed not to have anything outside of it. So if you've ever had an experience, you should be able to place it in these six things, right? What would, what would be outside of that? The awareness, the sensitivity to mental activity is quite expansive. I mean, we have all kinds of mental experiences, sublime, horrific. It's like the, Awareness of the mind, the activity of the mind is like a awareness of a production studio, a really good production studio. And so it's like a whole nother reality. I mean, a lot of our thoughts and mental images are about the five physical senses too, right? 
So we're sensitive in these six ways. And so there's two things in any moment, and especially as we learn how to sustain present moment awareness, it's not just what of these six things or what combination of these six things just happens to be uh, front and center in the forefront of awareness, but how the mind is relating to it. What's the mood? And this is an aspect of mental activity. The mood, the attitude, the frame of mind, the view. Like if your uh, past experience, you know, for those of you in the room, if you've been conditioned to think, oh, common ground is a sacred space. And then you have that lens on, right? So you, you see the black chairs, which are very ordinary from Costco, and you go, oh, sacred chairs. <laughs> you know, it's like the whole experience gets colored by the way we're relating. If there's somebody at work who at one point, two years ago, did something that you thought was disgusting, you know, whatever, sneezed all over themselves or something. And then it's, you've got this unconscious filter. Whenever you see that person, you just kind of like, oh, disgusting person. And so we have all these habits and some of us just tend to be an aversive type. And so that's kind of like a chronic filter or attitude. Some of us are kind of rosy, sentimental types. I mean, with all many different types. But as we, you know, now week three, we're experienced practitioners, right? We have to start to notice. And you can even drop the question in. How is my mind relating to experience? So the initial question, you know, week one was, what's the mind knowing? Now, equally important is, how is it knowing that, you know, with what filter, with what attitude, what's the mood? And just experiment, like I'll suggest during the guided sit tonight, um, just dropping a question in, like, what's the mood? What's the attitude? How's the mind relating? Or if you're, <clears throat> you've gotten familiar with some of your own top five habits, you know, in, in Greediness is one of them. Just to ask, is there any greed in the mind? Or is there any irritation? Or let's say boredom is a chronic tendency. How's the mind? Is, is there boredom? And when we ask these questions, it's really in the direction of a pure interest. It's not a judgment. I just want to be close. We just want to see things as they are. Right? It isn't about dominating or controlling or making something happen. And that's a point that really can't be made enough because one of the filters that, you know, is just almost always not seen is this idea like, I just need to do this and then I'll get a result, you know? And there's, we've been reinforced and it, we were reinforced in school, we're reinforced at work. And it kind of works, you know, we apply our willful effort and there's some result. So it's not about uh, giving that up, but in this practice, it isn't really like I'm doing mindful med mindfulness meditation in order to be calm. There's some truth to that, but it, we really miss out if, we limit the practice to this uh, more nuts and bolts of basically self, self soothing, like soothing the system down, calming the system down. And there are a lot of really good techniques and they're related to what we're learning, you know, meditative techniques to soothe, calm the system. It's really a nice thing to do when you're agitated or can't sleep or you know, we should, we should be learning these, you know, stress reduction techniques starting in kindergarten. There's no reason because they work and they, they are related to this, uh, these teachings that we're learning. But there is so much more value than just being able to settle the system, as nice as that is. 
And this is what we have to check out. And if we're kind of demanding a result, it won't it won't work. It's more it's more uh, gradual and subtle than that. Somebody asked the Dalai Lama this, you know, some version of the question, you know, have you noticed any change in your practice lately or something like that, or any benefit from your practice lately? And uh, he had a great answer. It was something like, well, if I look back this last week or month or last year, can't really see anything. But if I look over five years or 10 years or 20 years, yeah. And that's the thing. It's really, you know, even though a lot of you are making the effort to take the six week class and making the effort to find some time to do some formal meditation practice at home or listen to a guided meditation at home, we're really interested in a shift in lifestyle where the, this value of being present becomes the new default value. You know, we have, we have all kinds of default values, like not making a fool out of myself. And I don't even think about it, but it's operating in the mind because it's so kind of the background of the mind, like don't do anything stupid, <laughs> you know, or don't do anything stupid if someone's around to see you or something like that. And what we're doing is initially because it's new, we, we're, we have to be very conscious, like I do want to be present. What is the mind doing? What is the mind knowing? How's the mood? And we're and all the different tricks we've been learning, like when we're walking from the car to our office, oh, I can be present with the physicality of walking. You know, I don't have to just get lost in thought for these, you know, 90 seconds it takes to walk in from the building or from the parking lot. I can just notice the lifting and the placing of each step. Or I can just be aware of seeing. Not looking around, but just the visual experience being known or hearing. And then the thing about using these, you know, I say tricks, but they're just skillful means is what we call them in the Buddhist tradition. <clears throat> these skillful means, they create the ground, the stability, so that when some of our psychological and emotional habits get triggered, because the awareness, the present moment awareness is already stable, then when I get defensive or when I get greedy or I get lustful or I get angry or I space out, I'm, I'm much more likely to see it because I've got that continuity of awareness with the body, let's say. And then when the mind falls into some habit, that same stability of awareness will notice, oh, this is what the mind is doing. It's like this now. And we'll be able to notice whether that pattern, that habit is he helpful or not. Because there's no way we abandon unhelpful emotional, psychological habits without seeing them, not judging them, but seeing them for what they are. Like if I pick up a hot pan and I'm present enough to know it's a hot pan, it's very easy to let go. <laughs> but you know, if we're not aware that we're causing ourselves harm, that we're stressing the system out, causing other people stress, we can act in unskillful ways, stressful ways for ever, right? Chronic stress is, we don't even realize how much the mind, the body, the heart is holding because there's not that stability of present moment awareness. So it's really the great protector. And we need these, uh, we need the stability of present moment awareness and the continuity because it illuminates. In uh, Buddhism, it's sort of like it illuminates, we talk about it as this moral world, not moral in the sense that somebody's telling us what's right and wrong that the sensitivity of our own mind and heart will be able, because of the stability of present moment awareness, directly sense 
if how the mind is showing up, how the mind is relating, whether it's helpful or not. And then we can change because we feel like, you know, like I've been married to my spouse for almost 30 years now. And um, still, you know, and we're both, you know, longtime practitioners, but still I'll notice sometimes because there's awareness, I'll notice that, you know, there's a little digging, you know, a little poking, a little whatever, payback or it's sort of a low grade push and pull. I'm sure this is not uncommon, but it's so nice to be able to know it. Like I'm not, it's, it's harder and harder to be oblivious. So when I'm acting out, even in subtle ways, you know, wisdom awareness notices, oh, you're acting out. It's not helping, <laughs> not helping anybody. And so it's easier to naturally tease that stuff out, not because I'm even trying to tease it out, but it just stands out. It just stands out. And that's the real value of the practice. And um, in the sit tonight, you know, we'll do the two things we've been doing in other sets. We'll, we'll use these anchors, these specific objects like whole body, hearing, the breath, feeling the breath in a particular place, like at the nose, feeling the air touching as it goes in and out. Or some of you might prefer to just feel the expansion, that movement of the rib cage or the movement of the abdomen as, it, as we breathe in, it expands a bit. Of course, then as we breathe out, it contracts a little. And there's that ordinary physicality, right, of that movement. That could be an anchor or the touching or wherever the movement of the breath is clear for you. It can be specific to each person, like where it's easiest to notice breathing in and breathing out. We'll use these techniques because it really, like as a skillful means, it really uh, helps us to let go of everything because we're training the mind to be interested in the Ob, the meditation object, whatever it is, could even be a prayer. You know, when you think about human history with rituals and chanting, and there's so, and that it's all about this. The people, when they're doing whatever these sort of religious, spiritual activities, generally there's something to pay attention to, and you hold your attention there. And to do that, you have to let go of, you can't pay attention to anything else. And it's a, a very powerful learning because the mind is learning. There's still this diversity of experience. There's still all my worries, all the things I want to think through, all the past stuff I might want to regurgitate, all the future stuff I might want to think about. But we're choosing to keep something in mind. And there's real value in discovering that we can put everything else down. And, and then we'll notice that pleasure of the mind not being so tormented about everything else <laughs> that we're, we'd otherwise be thinking about. Because every time I see anything, even something pretty neutral like the floor, we can't have an experience of touch, of smell, of sight, of sound, of thought without having reverberations, like an opinion about what I just experienced. Oh, I like it, or I don't like it or I don't care enough to have an opinion about it. Even that is subtly stressful. So when I draw my attention away from all my sensitivity to my eyes, to my ears, to touch, through thought and smell and taste, right? When I'm, it's there, I'm still sensitive, but I'm choosing to just know one thing. It radically sent, uh, simplifies my experience. And that feels good. Just knowing this one thing, just doing this one thing. You know, it's kind of a cliche now in sort of new age circles, just do one thing at a time, right? But it, it's a, a meditative, skillful means that has an effect on the heart and mind. It feels good. It's a kind of healing because for some period of time when we're doing that, 
the mind is not getting pushed around by all the other experiences, not having to react, not having to have an opinion about all the other things that might come into the forefront of attention. So we'll do that. And we have been doing that for part of the sit. And the other thing we've been doing at the end of the sits is opening it up, right? And just, and not telling the mind, this is your meditation object, but whatever is in the forefront of attention, whatever the mind is knowing, then we're aware this is being known. And in just another moment, a completely different experience might be there. It might be a judgment about what I was just doing. Okay, judging is being known. And then there may be a moment of forgiveness. Oh, that's okay. Oh, forgiveness is being known. And then you might hear the blower. Oh, hearing is being known. And then you might realize, oh, there's seeing. Oh yeah, seeing is being known. So sometimes we'll call that open awareness practice as opposed to object-based meditation practice, right? Where we're using a meditation object. But we want to get good at both. And generally, but it's you know kind of specific to each of you, but generally emphasize the object-based meditation initially, because you'll get a more likely to get a sense of the pleasure of that the mind being secluded from the diversity of experience. Just that. And, and the mind can gather in that simple experience of knowing one thing, breathing in is like this, breathing out. And it, it's a way of collecting, gathering the energies of the mind. All the mind has to do is be intimate with this one phenomena. It's not that it's simple, nothing is simple really. I'm sure you notice as you pay attention to the breath or hear and you realize how alive it is, how, you know, intricate it can be even. So maybe I'll leave it here. You might want to just stretch your body a little bit, even stand, move a little so that you'll be comfortable sitting for about 30 minutes. And as always, we'll have time for discussion and questions after the sit. We learn quite a bit from hearing. So anything that comes up in the sit will be good to bring up. Good, and let's settle in. So we want our sitting posture as we've been talking, Shelley and I have been talking, we want the sitting posture to support what we're interested in the heart doing, which is to be upright, alert and relaxed. And just presuming that we can have both the alertness and the relaxation, both in the body, but especially in the mind, in the heart. Remember that if your mind and body feel stirred up, taking some time to do some deep, easy breathing. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as easy as taking the time to slowly fill the lungs in a relaxed way, and then very slowly empty the lungs without straining. And really sense that we have all the time in the world to fill and then to empty the lungs. And this can be an easy way to come back into more embodied presence here and now. And on days where you feel more wound up, you might even want to do this for five minutes, this deep breathing. So let's do one more of these long and easy breaths in and out. Take your time. And whenever you're done, Simply allow the breathing to continue on, on its own. And we can be grateful that 
The body doesn't need anybody's oversight. Body can breathe on its own. Even if the breath seems erratic or not quite right, just trust the body to do the breathing. And we'll take a couple minutes and we'll use hearing as a meditation anchor. You can allow the eyes to lightly close. It's okay to keep them open, but generally we have our eyes closed lightly for this style of meditation. And simply opening to the experience of hearing And notice, it's important to notice that hearing is already happening. It isn't something that we do actually, but more something that's recognized. Hearing is being known. And keeping hearing in mind, that's the being alert, remembering, keeping it in mind. And relaxation is really all about not needing to figure anything out, being in more of a receptive mode So let's try this in silence for a few minutes, awareness of hearing. Learning how to keep hearing in mind. And how relaxation really helps. Trusting this experience of hearing so ordinary. And noticing that hearing is here and now in the present moment.
And perhaps you can sense this wholesome pleasure. In Buddhist terms, we call it the pleasure of seclusion. The mind is secluded from the diversity of experience. It's just aware of hearing to some degree. And just doing the best we can. It's initially not easy to be attentive to something so ordinary. And that's why we, that's why we're training the mind, developing in a sense, a new muscle. So for just another 30 seconds, And then noticing this ordinary experience of the body sitting, whatever this array of sensation, changing experience of sensation of the body sitting. And breathing in for that duration of breathing in, just being sensitive to the whole body and then through the duration of breathing out, open and sensitive to the whole body, the totality of the body. But again, it's mostly about keeping the body in mind, not forgetting. Because awareness is already sensitive to this tactile experience of sitting. So we're just keeping it in mind in this alert and relaxed way as best we can, starting over as often as needed and also being curious and even friendly with the distractions that interrupt the continuity of awareness with the body. So let's do this in silence for a while.
And remember, you can use a mental phrase like breathing in, experiencing the whole body, breathing out, allowing the body to be. Something like that can create a little bit more support if you're finding a lot of distraction. Just see what helps. And check, how's the mood? How's the attitude that is knowing the body, knowing distractions? Is the mind kind or is it aversive, fearful? Again, it's not about judging, but just noticing how the mind's relating to the body, to distraction. And you might want to experiment with the more specific anchor, like feeling the air touching the nostrils and bringing the attention to a more singular point of experience or the rising 
and falling of the abdomen. And we're both alert and relaxed. Alert means that we're keeping the object the meditation object in mind and relax means we're not controlling, we're just simply knowing, which doesn't need to be tight. It's really more about remembering to notice We also use that alert and relaxed attitude when we notice distraction. We can have a friendly attitude about distraction. Oh yeah, this is what's being known. Planning mind is being known. It feels like this now in the body, in the heart. And then just let the distraction cease on its own. And then return to the primary meditation object. And be interested in that continuity of present moment awareness as best you can. And we'll continue for about 10 minutes in silence.
and again. Be really interested in those moments when you notice the mind's been distracted and notice what the attitude is the mind judgmental or controlling and simply notice that and see if you can begin to relate in a more friendly, wise way. Oh yeah, this is how it is sometimes, the mind wanders. This is being known here and now. We'll take the last couple of minutes and we'll do a more open awareness practice now. So feel free if you wanna practice with the eyes open, you can do that. Of course, we're not looking at anything in particular, just gazing down toward the ground usually. Soft gaze. And just aware of the totality of seeing and hearing and feeling sensation, maybe to some degree, some smells and tastes, and of course, the mental activity. And just sensing what it is to have the stability of present moment awareness when there are many different objects being known at different times. But the present moment awareness can also be quite stable, even with this open awareness practice. And we generally move slowly after a sitting period. Don't rush into anything. Ideally, you'd have a couple minutes at home after your sits just to be in that space. And that's the time to reflect on what you learned, what you saw, what was challenging, how did you relate to that, those challenging moments, what did you learn, what felt good, or pleasant in the practice? How did you relate to that? Did you get greedy about the good feelings if they came, good calm or whatever? So build that in, you know, if you have a busy day, don't just the sit end and in another minute you're in the car. End the sit a little bit earlier if you have to so that you have some time just to be reflective. Yeah, and as I've often mentioned, and I'm assuming Shelley mentioned this last week, um, we learn so much having people share. I know it can feel embarrassing. It's, you know, in a way more than sex and money. Talking about our own mind is sort of like weird or not cool. But we, it uh, 
really normalizes what it is to have a mind and to be turning the awareness back toward the heart and mind itself. Exactly what I mean, normalizing the mind. Because it's, it's so nice for a human being to, to say that, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I want to be alone with my mind. <laughs> I mean, you didn't say it exactly that way. But it's true. It, it can feel like, um, like sometimes wild, like being out with you know, animals that we're not familiar with. <laughs> and it's, the, th- the reason the mind is a scary place is we just haven't visited very often. We're so pulled into the world into our thoughts about things, we don't really have this exposure, you know, of being aware of the inner territory of our heart and mind. And absolutely, it's okay to use these supports. And, and by the way, these exclusive meditation objects are in a way one of these supports because it, it keeps us away from the you know, the last few minutes when I, I encouraged us to have that more open awareness, it can feel like a spewing waterfall, like so much. Now, hopefully by the end of the sit, there's some settling and it wasn't maybe hopefully not too wild, but it can be. But remember, we're not just after a pleasant experience. We're really after learning. We want to learn more and more over the years about the nature of the mind itself. We want to be able to be intimate with the mind. So when a, a storm comes in my mind and, and Mark is being defensive or Mark is being angry or Mark is, you know, whatever the emotional storm might be, um, I want to be really familiar. Oh, yeah, that's how it is sometimes. I get angry and it feels like this, it looks like this, so that I'm not surprised by these strong emotions or strong uh, reactions that can happen. That's where we do a lot of damage to ourselves and others is when we're swept away because we didn't see it coming. But we can get very familiar with these places, the monsters and demons and, you know, all the... (laughs) all the unseen territory in our own heart and mind. But so the the important thing is to move in that direction instead of going too fast, too much, too soon. Because what we'll do is we won't like the practice and we'll stop doing it. It will feel like you suggested too scary or too wild or just too much happening. I feel out of control. Why would I do that? And that's why people tend to fill up their lives with busyness because they don't know how to be with themselves, so to speak. So start in an easy way, use guided meditations, but always build in a little time where you don't have any crutch, any supports. So that's why I say, even if you're just using an exclusive meditation object for the great majority of the sit, Always leave at least three to five minutes at the end where you put on your meditation object. And sometimes, like I suggested tonight, I mark that change by opening my eyes at that point. Now, remember, you can practice with your eyes open the whole set, especially if you don't have a lot of clutter, you know, you have a nice plants or something in front of you that won't generate a lot of thought. Um, and especially if you tend to towards sleepiness, keeping your eyes open can be a nice uh, thing to do when there's a lot of sleepiness going on. But to always build in at least a few minutes at the end where we're learning how to be present with, it, it really helps us with daily life practice because it's just like whatever the mind is knowing, uh, the practice is to recognize this is being known. Now, this is being known. So we really see what the mind is like when it's not being directed to come back to the breath, to be with a prayer, to be with chanting, or to be with something more physical like you're washing the dishes and you're using that as your anchor for the present moment, just to feel the water, feel the movement, hear the sounds. 
So we really want to use these objects that ground us in the present moment, but we don't want to get dependent, but we have to build our confidence. And I think that's really what the response to Nancy's comment is. How do we skillfully build our confidence to take the hands off the wheel and just let it rip, let life, let experience, just do what it's going to do. Let the thoughts, let the emotions, let the sounds, let the sights, let the sensations just move. And it, there is a, even though it will feel initially, especially, but just generally it will feel at times wild, but it's such a relief not to have to feel like there's somebody who has to manage or control, you know, have the world on our shoulders, you know, like I got to hold this whole thing together. So to, I mean, we learn that at night when we go to bed, we do put down that sense of being a doer for a few moments until we start dreaming. <laughs> then we, the mind picks it back up again, you know, and we're back doing stuff. So to, in all the alertness and clarity that we can have in meditation practice, just to be profoundly in that receptive mode of this is being known is a real, um, and the thing is we'll notice the impulse to do in a fresh light because we won't immediately be the doer. That's, that's one of the reasons, um, and this is a good, I wanted to make this point. One of the reasons that part of the form of formal meditation is sitting still. Now it's a training. So maybe challenging to do for 30 minutes without a guided meditation, but for five minutes, you might be able to do that. And it's the same thing with the, the form of holding the body still relaxed, but still now, of course, there's going to be little movements, but to the degree uh, that we can, we want to move in the direction of stillness in the body because it really, that physical stillness is in line with that intention to be receptive, to be aware of what comes and goes. Because then we really, when, when something is stable and still, then all the movements become very obvious. So when the body and the mind, when there's some stillness, then the impulse to judge, the impulse to plan, the impulse to get the heck out of here, you know, to bolt, they stand out because the system is settled. The body's still, the mind is relative, the mind is really relatively grounded in present moment awareness. Then we really see the conditioning of the mind and we have a profound insight that deepens over the years. All that mental conditioning, all those patterns, they're real, they're there, but they're not self. They're not personal. We, but we just presume all of those, all of that psychological, emotional conditioning, all those impulses, tendencies, right? That's me. I mean, that's kind of the convention, but in our actual subjective experience, we realize, no, it's nature. It's just the nature of that impersonal conditioning expressing itself. And it's one thing to hear me say it now, but it's a, a profoundly transforming thing to see it actually in, in terms of your own heart and mind. It really liberates us from so much um, struggle and tension because of the presumption that things are personal. Like, I mean, just a simple example, when we end up, the body, mind, whatever, this life, we end up doing something stupid or humiliating. Well, if it's not personal, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's still, there will be consequences. People will think I'm weird or something because I did this humiliating thing. But there doesn't have to be that inner burden of being the one who did a stupid thing. That's based on the misperception that that whatever that somebody did that was humiliating or embarrassing, that it was me or self or mine. And again, it's hard to convey how powerful it is to get to know the mind, to see the mind 
always, you know, the mind just thinks. That's what it does. It imagines, it plans, it solves problems, it creates monsters, it creates pleasant experience, right? I mean, isn't that what your mind is doing all the time? Imagine yourself on a nice beach or imagine yourself being chased by wolves or, you know, it's just like one thing after another. It just fills space. And it's, and if, as, as long as I think it's me, I feel like I have to have an opinion about everything my mind's thinking and doing, right? And I feel like I should be in control of it. And there's so much tension, so much suffering and owning the mind as it's just like uh, some of you are probably parents, you know, and at some point you realize they're their own things, <laughs> you know, they're not my appendage. I'm not in control, you know, and uh, it's just true on so many levels about just being um, a healthy, relaxed human being. Just realize, oh, cause we use that phrase a lot, causes and conditions, meaning there are innumerable things in play right now like even in, in the wider world. And if we feel like we have to, you know, own it or be in charge of it, well, good luck. And usually week two, I do say a little bit about posture. And it, and it is worth worthy to spend some time learning. Um, and it will evolve over the years, and it depends on our age and depends how much yoga or stretching we do in our lives and all injuries that we've had. But um, even when we're really good, you know, in terms of listening and, and feeling through how we should sit and how long we should sit, even then there will be problems with pain, discomfort, legs falling asleep. <clears throat> And these are really powerful teachers for us, like noticing the mind's attitude around physical pain or noticing the mind's attitude, even having a fly or a mosquito land on us while we're sitting <laughs> or the foot leg falling asleep. You know, generally, if the kind of numbness we're getting, you know, because of the pinched nerve usually or the pressure on a nerve, if it goes away, one, you know, after a couple of minutes of stretching the leg out at the end of the set, then you don't, you know, doctors have told me and the general rap is you don't need to worry about limbs falling asleep. That doesn't mean it's pleasant, but the mind will turn anything into a drama. So again, you might have to build up, but maybe it's okay just to let the ache, let the pain, let the numbness that you're feeling be what it is. That's another reason to give yourself a little time at the end of the set before you have to get up and do the next thing is if the body is creaky or numb or falling asleep, then you've got some time to kind of get it up to speed again. But there's something about like not moving. Think about how much time you have that day for the sit be reasonable. And again, as you build up your capacity, so don't say, I'm going to sit for 45 minutes when you're going to drive yourself crazy because you're going to end up not continuing with the practice. It's going to be too painful or too challenging. Build on success. I know I can do 10 minutes. Okay, then do 10 minutes. And, and really feel good about that because you realize, oh yeah, it wasn't easy. Even during the 10 minutes, there was a lot of impulse to want to move, to want to think, to want to stop, but I didn't. And we really build that capacity, that trust, like there's some real, I'm learning a lot about the mind staying put, alert and relaxed. Same with the posture. So generally, like uh, for sitting, what helps is um, really think about the base. So those of you who are sitting on the floor, you know, we generally elevate the hips so that we tilt forward, that the knees get, then get closer to the ground. And that creates a, a wider base of support. And for chairs, you know, a flat chair, not one that sort of sets the body back like a lazy boy kind of chair, 
bit more like a kitchen chair generally. And then you might even want, especially if you're having sleepiness in your sits, you might want to support your lower back with a rolled blanket or something like that or a pillow. And over time, months of time, wean yourself so your, your upper back isn't having to lean against the back of the chair. You're just getting a little support in your back, lower back. But even so, you can, some people sit on a stool where their spine, you know, it's just like that stacking of the vertebra. It's not, the spine of course isn't straight, but it's stacked in a way that it has this integrity and then the head sits on top of it, right? And the pelvis creates the base, the pelvis and the legs create the base. And that really, because it takes some physical effort to sit, it really provides it, um, support for the alertness and the relaxation. Like if we're too comfortable doing a lying down meditation, it can really work for about seven minutes to 12, 13 minutes, depending on the person, because you have a lot of the relaxation part. And generally you can be alert for a little while when you're lying down, especially if you're not in a bed, but you're like lying down on a yoga mat or a piece of carpet, you got maybe a little pillow for the back of your head. Definitely it's worthwhile ex, uh, experimenting with the lying down meditation for shorter periods of time. Some people will put their elbow and upper arm at a right angle when they're lying down because that it's not, doesn't take too much effort. But if you fall asleep, the arm will fall and that will generally wake you up. Okay, that's about all I can do before I start falling asleep. Because the, it's really getting interested in that balance between being bright, alert, interested, and receptive, relaxed, allowing, trusting. It's really bringing those two values, two qualities to mind. And that's what we want to get with the body. If there's too much physical discomfort when we're sitting, then find a better way to sit where there's less discomfort or sit for a shorter period of time. But as we sit more and more and the confidence build, we can be with discomfort, being cold, mosquitoes, pain in the back, especially when we know the pain isn't doing damage. And you just have to you know, know your body well, like what pain is actually causing some strain that's going to live on after the sit's over. And what is just pain that isn't, that, you know, pain is like information. And sometimes that information is saying, you shouldn't have your leg like this because you're damaging it. You know, and other times pain is, you've just got chronic holding, chronic tension in this part of your body. And over time, that outer layer of energetic holding begins to, you know, as, as the concentration deepens, we sense the grip. And when we sense the grip, we can release it. But there are a lot of layers of it. And the practice isn't actually about that. It's kind of a positive side effect of the practice. How many layers of holding are released? But the real value of the practice is getting to know the mind and the impersonal nature of the mind, because it really shifts our relationship to everything when we realize how all of this is nature, just the activity of nature. We can really participate in our lives and our world with so much more freedom and kindness and love when we realize it's all just nature. This person asked about imagination, and they mentioned a few examples from their set. Um, including their file system, <laughs> but you know, in their imagination. And then also just uh, flying, like a pleasant uh, imagining of flying. And uh, one of the things we realize, um, because we're observing what the mind is doing in that receptive, aware way, we realize that the mind can create hellish experiences, right? And it can create, construct really beautiful experiences, right? Like I mentioned, it's the mind. One of the aspects of the mind is like a production studio. And, and no, it's not the point of practice to imagine or to construct really 
beautiful experience, even though the mind can construct really beautiful experience. And when it does, we should notice this is a really beautiful experience or this is there's a lot of pleasure here. So we want to be aware of it, but we don't, we're, the objective is to understand the nature of the mind, not to do something with the mind, not to create something with the mind, but to understand the mind's nature to create, like, and how that's impersonal. That's just what it does. Because in a way, there's a sense of being addicted to the intensity of what the mind constructs, you know, the likes and dislikes, basically. And there's an addiction to that. And so what we're doing is we're observing that, and that opens this other possibility, a kind of non-dependence. And that's what really frees up our participation in life, is that we're not dependent. You know how it is. It's like uh, when we really like, want someone to like us, it's really hard to kind of be with them. But when we don't care whether they like us or not, it's much easier to work with them, right? We can be free. And it's a little bit like that in the general sense of life. <clears throat> when we're really attached, when we're really afraid, when we're really dependent, everything's a little heavy or a lot heavy. Yeah, and it, it's a nice time for me to mention that one of your handouts that's in all of the emails that you received, we have the link to all the handouts. One of them is about walking meditation. And for those of you who have a good uh, Qigong or Tai Chi or even some of the more gentle or mindful yoga practices or just you like to walk or you have a dog that you walk a couple times a day, they can really lend themselves. And like uh, Greg was talking uh, awareness of movement is like a re uh, really effective meditation object because it's a very obvious thing for the knowing mind to know, just the experience of movement, the sensations of movement, and the mind can really gather. And that's one of the reasons why exercise and these things like Tai Chi and Qigong are so popular. There's real pleasure in being unifying the mind, gathering the mind. But remember, it's not just about that gathering. The point of that gathering, besides that it's healing and pleasurable, is that we learn a lot about the mind because that settledness you get, because you're just unified with the Tai Chi movements, then when other habits of mind arise, we really see them in their living color. And we can see that they're nature and not self, or they're skillful or they're unskillful. We really learn about the mental activity, the nature of mental activity. And so what I would suggest is keep doing all the movement things you like and really notice how, it, how that present moment awareness can get some real continuity and notice the pleasure that's there with it. That will all be very useful, but still sit and, and build your confidence that you can sit longer. Don't force it and see what you learn there that you're not learning in your Qigong. Because the disadvantage of a, like even walking meditation is that the mind in these movement practices uh, because they can be so absorb, absorbing, the, it's kind of the mind is too protective. So we don't really see the mind doing what the mind does. And that's what we need to see. That's why we need this lifestyle of mindfulness. Otherwise, we're kind of dependent on one guided meditation, whether it's a movement or not. But we really want to just let it rip, so to speak. Oh, and next, next uh, Tuesday when we gather, we'll spend um, most of our discussion time looking at what interrupts the continuity of awareness. And that's really in line with uh, Greg's comment. Like, we really notice that when we're sitting because the mind, like, why is that so hard for us just to sit and be aware? But it is one of the hardest things in the world. And if it isn't yet for you, it's either because you have really good concentration 
or because you're distracted the whole time and you don't realize it. <laughs> so anyway, we'll come back next Tuesday. Appreciate everybody being here. Have a good week, everyone.